Good, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 11th meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask people please to make sure that their mobile phones are on silent? Uh, I'd like to welcome Donald Cameron as a reporter from the ECCLR Committee on the Salmon Farming in Scotland Inquiry. The first agenda item will be on salmon farming, which may be contrary to what some people imagined with that this meeting was scheduled to talk about crofting reform, but the Cabinet Secretary has been called away to represent the government uh, today and therefore was unable to attend. So that meeting has been rescheduled, I think, for the 2nd of May. So I'd like to turn to agenda item one on salmon farming in Scotland, and I'd like to invite members after I've done so to declare any interests they have in this. I have declared my interest uh, at the beginning of this inquiry and would also refer uh, members to my register of interest in that I have an interest in a wild salmon fishery. Does anyone else wish to make a declaration? Donald. Yes, thank you. Can I also refer back to the um, meeting, I think, uh, in March, on March the 4th, I think it was, uh, and refer to my register of interest where I have an interest both in uh, fish farming and in a wild fishery. Thank you. Uh, this is our third evidence session on the Committee's Salmon Farming in Scotland inquiry, and the Committee will take evidence today from the regulatory bodies. I'd like to welcome Anne Anderson, the Chief Officer for Compliance and Be Beyond Portfolio, is that right? Yes, Compliance and Beyond, the regulatory um, side of our business. For Thank you. Department. For the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. Mark Harvey, the Team Leader of the Development and Infrastructure Services, the Highland Council. Alex Adrian, the Aquaculture Operations Manager for the Crown Estate Scotland, and Cathy Tilbrook, the Unit Manager, Coastal and Marine Ecosystems and Use Scottish Natural Heritage. I'm sure you have all given evidence before at the committee. If you haven't, just to say, please don't touch any of the buttons in front of you. Um, when you catch my eye and I call you in, the, uh, your, your microphone will be made live. Could I ask you, if you want to come in on a particular question, please to make sure that you do catch my eye. Um, if, if, if everyone looks away at the same time, then I will just catch one of your eyes. Um, but invariably, people do want to come in. And could I also say that once you start talking, could you just occasionally glance at me? Because if you are... Uh, expanding beyond the remit of where I think you're going on the question. It may cover another question. I may uh, ask you to, to hold that back. So um, I think that is it. The first question uh, today is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, you'll know that our sister committee, the Environment Committee, has done quite a comprehensive report about the environmental um, concerns that... Uh, various people have about um, fish farms but I wanted to start off we're obviously the Rural Economy Committee and we've taken evidence on the benefits of fish farming to the rural economy and in evidence to our committee on the 7th of March Steve Westbrook said not only is salmon farming an important employer in terms of the total but the types of jobs have been very suitable for people in rural areas who might not have had other opportunities particularly with the number of farming and fishing jobs going down in many areas. From your point of view, can you tell us how important the aquaculture industry is to the rural economy in the Highlands and in other local authorities and what benefits it brings? And everyone's looking at... Uh, no, no one's looking at me at that no. stage. Who'd like to lead off? Mark, would you like to oh, go yeah. on that? Um, yeah, it's um, yeah, quite present. I was at uh, committee, our, uh, our planning committee, uh, yesterday, where we approved two fish farm applications. Both of them were in an area of sky, which is regarded as fragile, and quite definitely a uh, weighty material consideration for um, the committee members in that case was the uh, social and economic benefits. And what was being said at the committee was um, it, it's not so much the, the number of jobs, uh, which are, uh, per farmer was relatively small, it's the fact that they so often being located in uh, a rural area, an isolated area, um, and in this case, a, a designated fragile area in terms of uh, in terms of employment, population retention, and that sort of thing. So, um, yes, in those circumstances, it, it probably at the moment represents uh, fish farming represents a, a f relatively unique 
employment opportunity because it, it is arriving for, for other factors, of course, for other um, operational factors arriving in areas which are not supporting uh, employment growth uh, in, in many other uh, aspects. Um, John, you wanted to ask a, a, a question. I'll come back to you again. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that, Mr. Harvey. I, I wonder the extent to which, indeed, the understandable wish to see employment in fragile areas. Does that intrude onto planning considerations that disproportionately or inappropriately at all? Well, that's a good question <laughs> to a planner. Um, as a planner, I'd say I, I would hope not, but you're absolutely right, of course. It is, it is part of the mix, part of the, the, the job of the planning committee, part of the job of, uh, of planning officers, of course, is to weigh up all the material considerations, of which that is one, and place it against the uh, uh, other considerations that um, are, uh, uh, are also pressing to that, um, that particular application. And I have to say, with aquaculture applications, it's quite a mix. So, you know, we, we, uh, yesterday we were looking at landscape uh, close to a national scenic area. Um, we were looking at uh, um, wild fish interactions. There was a, uh, so a freshwater pearl mussel uh, issue uh, was relevant to the, uh, to, to the site. So all of those things are weighed up. So the answer is, I hope not, because <laughs> that shouldn't be happening with any consideration. Um, they should be weighed up in, a, in an appropriate manner, and that really is the, the planning system at work. John. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. A, a comment to you, convener, and that is, uh, I'm not sure, but it may well be that I'm an objector to that particular application, so I think it's appropriate that I say that. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Um, Cathy, do you, do you want to uh, comment on that, the interaction between the environment and uh, employment? Um, it, see, it would seem to be something that SNH might have to balance. It, it is part of the balancing duty that we take into account when we provide our advice to, to local authorities on, uh, on aquaculture applications. Um, I think we, we certainly, we certainly recognise the importance, the, the socio-economic socio importance of, of, of aquaculture as an industry, particularly in the sort of fragile communities that have been discussed. Um, but obviously our, our kind of core purpose is to consider the, the impacts on, um, on biodiversity and, and landscape. Um, so we would, we, you know, we would provide that advice, advice and, and take into, into consideration um, the socioeconomic factors, but really the, the main players in terms of weighing up those factors are, are the local authority. Okay. Uh, Peter. Just a follow-up to that, to, to, to yourself, Cathy. I mean, how, how often or has ever SNH objected to a, a planned increase uh, or a new fish farm? Has that, has, has, has that ever happened in your experience? Yes, we, we have objected um, yeah. to... to, to you know, a number of, of planning applications for either for new farms or for, for increases or changes, um, depending on, on what we, we, we um, consider to be the natural heritage impacts of those, of those developments. But we go through a very careful process in terms of coming to that decision, and we don't take it lightly. Okay. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Gail, I think you've got to follow up. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask probably Mark, actually. Um, I took advantage of the lovely weather up west last week and uh, visited a fish farm. And one of the things that they told me and also members of the local community in that area around Loch Carr and Shieldig Torridon was that there are plenty of jobs, but not so many houses. Is that a planning consideration that you would take into con account when a fish farm goes in? Or is that completely separate? If it is, how can we marry the two up? Um, that is, it is separate. Um, so uh, it, it's it's relevant to all questions that we, we, we all applications that we deal with. If it if it creates employment, we want to make sure that there aren't other factors. We should be bringing jobs and housing and, and other um, services together. So that rather falls into the sort of the other side of planning, the development planning side, the strategic planning side, where one would hope that the the, the local plan um, was making provision for enough housing to support a, a reasonable number of, uh, of jobs. Um, in, in terms of aquaculture, uh, it's probably fair to say that the emphasis at the moment is very heavily on, from planning point of view, development management. So aquaculture is, is very much focused on planning applications, so they're individually assessed and so forth. We lack a overall framework, um, something that would 
indicate an area as being particularly suitable for aquaculture, an area that wasn't so suitable for aquaculture. That would enable the planning system, of course, to, um, to match more closely um, potential future housing demand to potential future job creation. At the moment, it's all a bit um, by application, per application, um, which, of course, is, is not the development planning system in, 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 in operation. Uh, it is difficult to plan ahead on, on that basis. Okay. And uh, when considering applications for new fish farms, um, I was following the Highland Council um, from a couple of days ago. Were there any um, issues in the Eclair report that were considered in, in the planning application or would be considered going forward in any new applications for fish farms? Um, yes, I'm, I'm, well, uh, yes, I mean, it, it, the, the report was, was highly relevant to um, the, the issues that we were dealing with at the time. I mean, I, th I think it, um, you know, it, it, it certainly hit the target in terms of identifying the things that we are, um, I think, probably fair to say, struggling with a little bit uh, when, it, when it comes to applications, particularly th those issues of uh, a lack of um, background information on some environmental uh, issues, uh, the wild fish um, issue being, being the, the, the key one. Um, so I think it covers the ground, but perhaps it obviously it wasn't coming up with, with the answers that would, would enable us to overcome those problems at, at the moment yet. Yeah. Um, okay. I think that'd be fair to say. I wonder, Cathy, do you want to comment on that? Because it seems to tie in the, the Eclair report was, mm. was, I think, forthright would be, would, 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 would be a summary of it. Yeah. Uh, has SNH been mindful of that report when they're considering fish farm applications? Well, I, I think you know, it picks up on a lot of the things that we already are, are raising in our, in our advice that we provide on, on, on fish farm applications. I think um, the report does sort of, it's a very good summary, I think, of the key issues that, that we're, we're currently sort of grappling with, and I think Mark's right, that I don't think we've quite yet got the answers to all of, uh, all of those issues, particularly in relation to, I think, from our perspective, wild salmonids and also um, ADDs. Um, so I think, um, you know, we found that a very helpful kind of um, summary of, of, of issues that we would like to see, you know, bottomed out with good solutions. Um, thank you. Just to go back um, and to tie up the economy side of it, um, how important is agriculture to the economy, not only to the highlands and the, the rural economy, but the economy of Scotland as a whole? Mark, shall I? <laughs> yes, that, that wasn't a look of. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I just can't answer that question directly. But uh, we are aware that it's 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 an important export industry. Um, I, th I think there's also an issue, isn't there, with with salmon being a sort of iconic Scottish product. Um, it sort of sits sits along some other alongside some other iconic um, Scottish issues. So. Um, some, actually, it came up yesterday and someone, someone said to me, you know, really what Scotland needs to be doing is making sure that its salmon is considered the best salmon um, of, available worldwide. It has that sort of premium product um, side to it. Um, and in, in those circumstances, of course, it would be, you know, a, a, a become an important part of the, uh, Scotland's export uh, economy. Yeah. Okay. Which ne leads neatly on to the next question from Mike Rumbles. Much convenient, and I want to focus on regulations and the <laughs> regulatory regime. And we're all well aware of what the Environment Committee said about this, and if I can just start by quoting it, the committee is not convinced that SIPA or any other agency uh, is effectively monitoring the environmental impact of salmon fisheries. The committee is also not convinced that the regulations, protocols, and options for enforcement and prosecution for the sector are appropriate and are being appropriately deployed. Now, that's quite strong criticism, so I'd like you to be able to respond to that, but I'd also like to ask you in your own view, and across the panel, what elements of the regulatory system work well from your, your, your view? So could you could respond to the specific criticism of the Environment Committee and tell us what you think works well as, to balance that? Uh, absolutely. Um, in terms of uh, the environmental regime, uh, which SIPA is responsible for, uh, we undertake a process of application, application assessment and identification, and, and clearly do link into the uh, planning process uh, as a statutory consultee. 
Um, it is based on um, scientific evidence, uh, as is all environmental decisions, or um, wherever possible. Uh, there are also high gaps in uh, the evidence, um, and I think that you know the, the, the paper and the report identified that. Uh, in terms of the uh, regulatory controls, uh, fish farm uh, regulation and application is under the controlled activities regime, <coughs> which is a direct uh, link in from the Water Framework Directive um, and controls the discharges at the present time to the water environment. Um, our sampling and monitoring exercises then evidence any environmental harm and it is a predictive uh, use of models, which is very common and is, is the approach taken in the, in the majority of the uh, environmental arena globally uh, when assessing applications in any um, media. So marine environment is not unique in the use of models uh, and then identifying and using the monitoring and regulatory controls to uh, best explain truth the model to track the model, to predict, and then to respond to it. Um, we are currently, we commenced a review in February of last year into aquaculture as part of our changing approach as a regulator, environmental regulator, uh, accepting the changing uh, planetary uh, aspects in terms of environment um, and climate change. Uh, part of that is that wider suite of review around uh, controls in the conditions uh, for every, any individual license and also in terms of the access and availability to monitoring, including new monitoring techniques and new models. Um, we're coming to the end of that process and uh, due to be reporting on that um, by June, uh, end of June this year. So eminently in terms of concluding that um, year's worth of review into aquaculture. Um, our regulatory regime uh, allows a large scope it's the interpretation and use of conditions to improve and to uh, innovate uh, both within regulatory um, uh, adoption of legislation and our, our manner in which we use it but also to encourage uh, those operators be they marine or elsewhere to innovate and to keep up with uh, best available technologies um, using the, the, the two processes of control, condition and baseline legislation. Um, um, I may not have answered your question. Though. Well, do you, do, you, do, you th do you think, the, I mean, you were specifically, SEPA identified, along with other agencies, but particularly SEPA, you didn't really tell me what you thought was working well, and whether the whole system is working well. I mean, are you working in isolation? I mean. Across, and I'd like to hear the other contributors as well, because one of the questions is, should there be one overall regulatory body to, to, to oversee this, rather than, it, than the four of you, for instance, here? Um, so what is working well, and is the criticism unfair or fair? So, Anne, Anne I'm going to ask you to come back in, but I will come to each member of the panel. Um, to ask where they have had concerns, whether they've monitored those concerns on developments uh, to try and answer Mike's question. So, Anne, if you'd like to start off, and then I'll start with Cathy and, um, and work that way along. Back to Anne. Okay. Anne. Yes. Um, I think there are elements that work well. Um, as with every uh, regulation, we always want to improve. That's, that was the purpose of that review exercise. And increasing um, monitoring is a key part of that, using every available bit of monitoring. And... Um, uh, the work that's done by uh, not just colleagues that sit here, but other uh, regulators, in this case, Marine Scotland. Um, joining up and having access to all of that data, there is always room for improvement. And I think that most definitely was recognised in the report, the ability for uh, the regulatory uh, partners to work more collaboratively uh, to join up some of the, the gaps. Uh, there's a number of uh, joint uh, research projects that are already underway, have been underway for uh, a number of years, um, significantly new um, cases working in partnership with industry and academics is a key component to that, um, and commissioning additional research, so very much pulling together the uh, government funding uh, to target any um, research work we do to fill those gaps in knowledge. Um, Really important that we get that evidence. Um, I, I made reference to us being an evidence-led 
uh, uh, regulator we need to be uh, to be able to demonstrate uh, harm. Um, and uh, part of that piece is to increase the level of evidence, so increasing the volume of monitoring that's undertaken by operators uh, and by the entirety of those uh, partners that do have that component as part of the remit. Really significant, joining it up and then having the ability to access, use and to regulate to it. Um, and that's part of the suite of things. Uh, there's questions around our depositional zone consultation and the conclusion of that. That, that process there is very much around encouraging uh, movement into um, areas of the uh, marine environment that have not been previously accessible due to limitations on older models. Uh, so making use of new technology models and continually to refresh uh, is something that as a regulatory component we have to do. So um, I think there's always room for that. Uh, but we're actually working from a, quite a solid um, basis um, in terms of that um, uh, approach. Uh, our new model that was introduced by Marine Scotland um, supports, but it's only one aspect of um, the use of modelling and, and uh, March reference uh, to the ability to assess that total impact it relates to cumulative impact modelling and use of hydrodynamic models, which are now available and which uh, we have been piloting and testing over this last year to ensure that our regulatory changes, um, you know, as, as part of that uh, innovation as an as a environmental uh, organisation, are actually able then to be delivered, evidence-based, backed up and used in court. Um, so there's packages of work that are underway um, to, to deliver a, a stronger uh, suite of re regulations, and that very much is about joining up the regulatory partners. Um, yeah. Cathy, do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, specifically in relation to your question about what works well at the moment, I would maybe pick out, um, I think there's been a much greater move in recent years to, to focus on pre-application discussion. Um, and that for us has been really helpful and we've, we've certainly embraced that. We try to put a lot of our resource now into that pre-app um, discussion with, with industry partners. Um, and I think the key thing there is trying to, at the very early stage, identify what the constraints might be about maybe hopefully more than one site that they're considering at that point so that we can steer um, you know developers away from the sites where we think they're likely to the, be the most environmental problems um, and uh, you know it ties in really with what um, Mark was saying about ideally we would we would like to see better strategic planning in the uh, from the outset you know identifying where are the most suitable locations um, so that we're not having to have that discussion about, well, that's a really bad site, you know, at the, at the, at the individual application stage that we've, we've gone through that process. And there is useful work. Marine Scotland have been doing some good work on heat mapping. Um, so once that is, is kind of out there and in the public domain, I think that will help. But, you know, having some form of better strategic planning to steer um, developers to good sites, I think, will really help. But certainly that pre-app phase has been good and... Um, we think that that's certainly probably leading to a, a decrease in the number of um, applications coming into the system where we do have big problems with things and where you know, we might have to raise an objection. Um, issues that I think we still um, you know, feel are, are problematic, you, you mentioned monitoring. Uh, we don't, SNH doesn't have a role in post-consent monitoring, um, but I do think there are issues there. I mean, we, I think in the Eclair report, it referred to the kind of evidence of damage, particularly within MPAs or um, to priority marine features. Now, in relation to MPAs, our role is, is, is on site condition monitoring, monitoring the condition of the features within protected areas. But the, we do that on a, a quite a, a long cycle, um, just because of the, the you know the resourcing costs of actually going and doing um, you know marine monitoring is very expensive to do. We don't have a lot of um, resource to go and monitor those sites on a very regular basis, and we deliberately um, select the, the stations for the survey points for monitoring away from the likes of a fish farm because obviously that's not going to be very representative of, of the site as a whole. And therefore, it's very unlikely that our routine site condition monitoring on that lengthy cycle will pick up um, issues relating to change and, and damage to, to features from, for, from a fish farm. So I think there is something there about... Um, 
better use of the routine monitoring that other partners like CEPA are doing and linking that back into better understanding of what the impacts are on, on sensitive features like merle beds, which were mentioned in, in, the, in the Eclair report, just so that we have a better understanding of you know, what are the long-term impacts, what might be recovery rates, how much um, you know, can, can we actually say about um, you know, damage on a wider, a wider area from the direct footprint of, of fish cages. So there's probably quite a lot in there we need to, we need to come back to. A few questions lining up, but I'm, okay. I'm going to go right down the panel and then maybe bring the questions in at the end. Alex, do you want to make a comment on that? Thank you. Yes. I think um, what's wrong with the, with, with the regulatory framework, I don't think it really recognises the circumstances under which fish farming is, is being undertaken. Um, most of fish farming, like other marine businesses, the issues arise through interactions, both with the natural heritage and with, uh, and with other users. And at the moment, there's too much of a development focus rather than a management focus in the scrutiny that's applied. And I think that needs to come forward. Part of that, as Anne says, is increased monitoring and improved monitoring. Um, the other aspect on that is then you've got to look at the framework in which this operates. And I think there's... Uh, the good things about the, the regulatory framework are, is, are that we probably re recognise the issues. I don't think we have the right tools necessarily to properly address them. Uh, what, has ha what we've heard of previously is um, increasing focus on things like adaptive management. Now, taking into account what Cathy said about pre-application uh, conversations, a very important part of that, but there is, as far as we can see, no real means of a ongoing accountability throughout the term of a business for undertakings giving at a pre-application stage. And the point about those undertakings is those circumstances are likely to change. The marine environment is very dynamic, it's changing, we've got long-term and short-term seasonal changes. The undertakings or the means by which they might be achieved will vary and change over time. And how can you review and maintain a, a, a scrutiny on accountability that these are being properly undertaken, according to what was spoken of at, at the pre-application stage? So I think we have the right bits and pieces, they've just not been put together mm -hmm. in the right order, if you like. I think we need a, an overarching framework that governs the relationship between the agencies and we need a framework that acknowledges the uncertainties and the unpredictability of the environment that we have and that and the focus is on management rather than development. Mark, do you want to make a comment? And then yes. I'm going to come back to Mike Rumbles and then take one or two other questions. So yes. Not. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree uh, with, with anything that's been said. Um, I would say, speaking from, uh, from a planner's point of view, that we have the overarching framework, and that is the planning system. We just don't use it very well. Um, one of the we talk about multiple regulation. Multiple regulation, I don't think, is unusual. If you build a house, you know, you'll need planning permission. You'll need building standards approval. You might need other other licenses and approvals as well. Um, any one of those could stop you of building the house, um, but no, none of them stand in the way of, of each other. So I don't think multiple regulation necessarily is, is, is a problem. There's always the danger if you create one huge regulator that, because its front left leg can't move forward for one reason, the whole body doesn't move forward, whereas where we are at the moment, we could grant planning permission, even though further down the line there might well be a car licence issue, uh, uh, which hopefully could be resolved, you know, um, but if not, would, would stop the um, farm going ahead. So I don't think multiple regulation is necessarily a problem. I think elements that work very well, I mean, not forgetting most, plan, most fish farm applications come in as EIA developments. They come um, uh, uh, associated with an environmental statement. That's a fairly high level of environmental control that most applications, most planning applications don't, uh, don't have to, uh, uh, to go through. So, it's not that it's it's not being uh, regulated. I think we look. Um, I think we find we we can deal comfortably with issues of landscape, for example. Um, that's uh, in the planning system, uh, and I think we're comfortable in using consultee responses. I think we're happy with those consultee responses we get. Where we are, where we are weak is that we seem to um, somehow, 30 years, 40 years into the fish farming industry still lack information about some fundamental aspects of its interaction with the natural environment. And, and wildfish, sea lice and wildfish would be, would be the classic example. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I came into this job sort of two years ago, and I, I will admit I'm, I'm a critic of the current situation. I think probably we all are, because all our organisations are looking at, at, at ways of improving it, and the, the um, previous committee's report picked up, I think, on that um, culture there and that, that, that movement that's going on. We find ourselves at the moment um, with, uh, and this was, this was true yesterday at committee, with issuing planning commissions with an environmental management plan attached to them. Now, fundamentally, that's about allowing the authority a role within monitoring the sea lice numbers within the farm and coupling that with a requirement on the uh, 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 operator to carry out some level of wild fish monitoring uh, and possibly um, knock-on effects, freshwater pearl mussel monitoring and so forth. Um, I think that's a, that's a positive move, but I do recognise that it's, it's, a, um, it, it, it's, it's a very piecemeal approach to what is more, more of an, a, a general environmental problem. So I would regard that as both a strength and a weakness. We are, we are a, a, um, addressing the issue, but I don't think we're addressing it terribly well. It could be done better. Do you want to come in? I, mean, I was rather briefly. amused in a way of Alex's response. Um, we're playing all the right notes, but not necessarily in the right order, as used the Eric Morecambe analogy. But um, on a serious point, I'd like to ask Mark in particular. Um, Highland Council has to deal with applications, as I understand, as they come in and deal with the application. Isn't there a concern, though, um, a lot of the criticism is based, that the whole industry is out there and should there not be an overarching plan or an overarching approach to fish farming development across the highlands, rather than taking, as you have to do now, ind individual applications and give a yes or a no to that? Yes. Okay. Um, That's fine. By um, I, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's running up. So a concise yes, no answer being yes is perfect. Uh, Peter Chapman... And then I'm going to... Uh, no, sorry, Gail Ross, then Peter Chapman. Thanks, Kevin. I have two specific questions. Um, the first one is for Anne. You talked about the um, DZR model that you're preparing to, to, to change, but the Eclair Committee has said that um, they're concerned that the development of the new model has not been peer-reviewed. They're also unclear how the model takes impacts beyond deposition on the seabed into account. They have written to SEEP as seeking further information. Do you know if that further information has been provided to the committee yet? Yes, it has. Uh, we have responded. It has um, a date, uh, date of the 28th of March, and we have answered the various questions. Uh, the DZR um, uh, proposal is actually for a very small part of, um, and I, I say that in the wider context of marine fish farming, it relates to organic loading. Um, and the model and the, the reference I was making around the uh, use of the new auto depot mod is, is, is the facility that has been, has been assessed, um, ran by Marine Scotland. Um, we have uh, our own in-house modelling team who have been part of that reviewing and assessment process. Um, the actual truthing of models links to real monitoring, grab sampling, you know, analysis in, in a laboratory and then testing back in. Um, and the hydrodynamic model, which doesn't feature and did not feature in the depositional zone regulation, but is an available tool to use, has, has and will be part of the future assessment process going forward. This is a particular tool which, in answer to the, to the, to the concerns raised, um, we have been testing and identifying uh, what uh, capabilities there are. Uh, I, I made reference to continuing to need to, to innovate as regulators and to keep up with technology ourselves, um, whilst we require our businesses to do so. Um, hydrodynamic modelling gives a, an additional layer which helps to inform the more information we have, the better decisions we can make. Um, and hydrodynamic modelling allows us to be able to determine that cumulative impact. So in the case of uh, locations, uh, wherever they happen to be within the Scottish coastal waters, uh, you're assessing the, the total impact of 10 uh, sites within a one farm management zone, um, and then modelling and monitoring hotspots, which again can be predicted and truthed. The, this is a key aspect of going forward when we talk about enhanced monitoring and additional controls and building more information. That also is on the basis of having new analytical methodology 
and the ability to use um, uh, DNA um, assessment and technology uh, for uh, organic loading. Um, so trials and two years into a project which will allow for the same amount of one sample, we're going to get you know, 10 samples for the same cost, instantly change the ability to get more information on what is happening, not just within the vicinity of marine cage fish farms, but being able to predict where the tides and the shifting sands uh, will, will, will uh, move organic load. Yeah, okay. good. Uh, and I'm, I'm just looking at you. If I'm jiggling my pen like that, it's probably... Stop. It's prob I, I will, it's probably... I will make sure I shall do that, Edward. <laughs> OK, yes. if you watch the pen. And Sorry. A, a really uh, quick second question to Cathy. Um, MPAs are set up for a number of different reasons around the coast. Do you believe that there should be more regulation and monitoring of fish farms that are in MPAs? Um, I think we would like to see a, a better linkage back to understanding, as I said, you know, in terms of um, a better kind of link up between the post-consent monitoring that, that Anne, Anne and Sipa are doing and, and others are doing, um, so that we can better understand those impacts. Because at the moment, I think we are quite good at liaising with the regulator, regulators, local authorities and SEPA about um, whether it's appropriate to site a fish farm in an MPA, depending on the sensitivity of the features for that MPA. So in some cases, there may not be any problem in having an, a, a fish farm within an MPA if, if the features within that MPA are not sensitive to, to the type of pressures that fish farming causes. Um, but on, some, on other occasions, we would suggest micrositing the farm to avoid those features. But I think probably what we do need to get better at doing now is, is, is particularly with the new modelling that, that Anne's talking about, um, just checking that we are correct in the assumptions that we're making about you know, where the, where the, where the, the, the deposition um, from the fish farm is ending up. Yeah. Are we right in, in, in suggesting that by having a farm located in a particular area, we've avoided impacts on the merle bed, for example, long-term impacts, particularly for those slow-growing features like merle? Um, you know, do we, do we know enough about over a long term whether, whether we can detect changes and, and impacts that might relate to, to the pressures from the fish farm? Okay. So there's, there's, there's issues there, but it's not, it's not a sort of blanket. We don't think that there should ever be fish farming within protected areas. Um, it's not as simple as that. Yeah. Peter. Uh, again, specifically at the line and, and SIBA issue here, so you, you spoke about regulatory changes earlier on in your earlier answer. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that it, in its Fish Farm Manual of 2005, SIBA acknowledged that it had a role to protect salmon and sea trout from the impact of sea lice. Now, more recently, SIBA has denied having any such responsibility for that. Why has there been such a fundamental change in SIBA's position on the sea lice issue? So um, the introduction of the Water Framework Directive uh, led to a change. Uh, I make reference to the Controlled Activities Regulations, which is the suite of regulations that we use. Uh, uh, previous uh, legislation came under uh, COPA, Controlled Pollution Act. Um, part of um, the, the uh, agreements and arrangements and, and you know, trying to ensure who does what and takes leads on in terms of areas uh, meant that when uh, in 2005 that shift changed occurred, and, and, and please, you know, Mark made reference to his two-year introduction to aquaculture. Uh, I'm a year and a bit into aquaculture, so uh, identifying the 2005 uh, process and decisions back uh, 10, 13 years. Uh, essentially, um, we have the, interpreted the activity under the controlled activities regulations as the discharge into the marine environment. Mm -hmm. um, and in that interpretation, it's relating to the, uh, the, the obviously the organic load and any chemicals and medicines. Um, the activity of the fish farm and has how it then interacts with that wider environment. We have a biodiversity role and we, we assess that, but we actually, in terms of uh, the context, there's a 2010 uh, working arrangements document um, that, that sets out uh, the, lead, the responsibilities and interactions by the regulators within Scotland when it comes to assessing and um, uh, participating in. So Marine Scotland having the lead uh, wild fish um, assessment within marine waters. Uh, under WFD, we have the uh, freshwater assessment um, and we take, we take, we stop at that line. Um, I see the pen moving, so. <laughs> It doesn't have to be quite that uh, blunt. <laughs> okay. Before we move on, I'd just like to 
a, a quick question to Anne and Cathy, perhaps. A, a direct question, a yes or no question. And, and, and the question is, has the regulatory framework that is in place at the moment protected or enhanced the environment in which salmon farms operate? Has it protected and enhanced the environment, yes or no? Cathy, do you want to answer that and then Anne? Yes or no? I, 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 I don't think I can answer that yes or no. I, I, it, it has, I couldn't say it had enhanced. I think to, to, to most extent it has, it, it has um, you know, hasn't, uh, hasn't degraded it because we've got safeguards in place, but I think there are some issues that we've touched on that, that still need to be, to be in, improved. Sorry, that was nowhere near a yes or no answer. But <laughs> uh, Anne's going to prove you wrong and say yes okay. or no. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I think Cathy's actually quite right. There isn't something as simple as yes and no when it comes to this particular okay. question. I'm afraid. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is John. Thanks very much, convener. Um, we've talked about the present regulatory environment, and you've all, I think, said there's strengths and there's issues that maybe we want to work on. So I'm, I'm wanting to think about if we are going to develop, or this industry is going to develop, and say we're going to have twice as many salmon, twice as many fish farms. A going forward, or more, or th thereabouts, but a, a fairly sizable increase. What, what is the impact of that then, on top of what you've already said? Um, I mean, for example, as I understand it, Crown Estate would get twice as much income. So if you've got any costs, you can double up your staff or whatever it is. But I'm not sure if SNH, if if the fish farms double, do you get extra income? I, I'm guessing not. A, and therefore, how if you've already said that your resources are maybe a bit thin at times to inspect, so would that mean you could only put in effectively half the effort if there's twice as many farms per farm? And I mean, SEPA as well, there's, there's been suggestion that a, there's not a lot of un, 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 a, unexpected visits to farms. Um, so would that mean if there was more farms, you'd even do proportionately less? Or have you got a way of handling that? So it's, it's basically how do you react? What's your reaction to the idea that the whole thing could double? Okay, and I'm going to go to Alex first, because <coughs> the suggestion is that he's the one beneficiary. So, uh, <laughs> Alex, if you go first, and then we'll take Cathy, Mark, and then Anne. Uh, the first thing I'd say is that um, we, we are managers rather than owners. So the uh, increased funds from a, a doubling of the industry or, or anything approaching that would be going to the Scottish Consolidated Fund rather than necessarily ourselves. Would that be net of any expenses you have? Net of expenses. Yes, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think if, if you're looking at it, um, you've got to ask whether we're going to have that doubling and that increase on the basis of what... Are we going to have simply more of the same or can we achieve that through a different means. And I think this then feeds into the questions earlier about the regulatory framework and the way in which we monitor it. And our view is that you, we need to maybe take a closer look at what um, marine industries historically have done to regulate themselves or to exert some kind of control. And that is, again, coming back to this focus on management and management plans and accountability uh, that allows for uh, transparent accountability that allows for undertakings to be seen to be met, but also it, 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 it can offer up an agility and, and the flexibility to, to move with changing circumstances that you get in the marine environment. And the fundamental part of a management plan is review. I think if you look at the, re the regime that we have now, um, permissions are granted uh, from in, plan, in the case of planning, it's in perpetuity. Uh, SEPAs are, are reviewable, but I think in perpetuity, by and large, out of 25 years, we need to have some form of review in corp that, that, can, uh, that, that can address the fact that circumstances do change. Can we check that the farmers out there are recognising and acknowledging and adapting to those particular changes? So I think we, we can achieve uh, certainly an increase. I don't know whether it will double or not. But it has to be with a greater degree of accountability, but alongside that accountability, giving the flexibility for the farmers themselves to undertake the necessary changes to ensure that they remain sustainable. So, um, yes, in short, it'll be more money for the Crown Estate, and then that will in turn be passed on, sorry, Crown Estate Scotland, that'll in turn be passed on to uh, the, the Scottish public purse. But more importantly is, you know, can we, uh, can we expect the industry to maintain its economic and environmental performance alongside all of that? 
And that's where I think we really need to look at just what we're doing. There needs to be a central pillar focused on management plans. That's how other marine industries work. You work on reviewable management plans. We need to somehow incorporate that in to give everybody the assurance and the accountability that things are being done properly. Uh, not necessarily from a stakeholder side, but also the fact that the industry will want to have the assurance that if it does go to the trouble of doing things properly and is seen to be accountable, it confers an assurance on itself and you can get a confidence that can you know, underpin investment on that side as well. Okay, well, um, SNH supports the sustainable development of the aquaculture industry in Scotland, um, but I think we are concerned about growth targets that are set without, um, in accordance uh, with uh, environmental capacity. Um, so I think, you know, what we said before about trying to get a better handle on how much scope there is out there for locations, for ex expansion, for new farms, um, that would be able to be developed without the kind of environmental risks that we've, we've talked about. Um, we need that. We need that understanding before we can actually set um, targets that, that, that actually are, are, are meaningful and can be delivered without, without risk to, to the Scottish environment. So can um, I ask, sorry, you're um, saying, are you saying that nobody knows what the capacity for fish farms is? I, I, I think we're, we're, we're quite a long way from, from really knowing that. But the other part of that is that, as, as Alex was saying, um, with innovation to overcome some of these issues, um, then again, that, you know, there might be much more scope for, for expansion. So that, that, that you know, that there's, there's an issue there about identifying what capacity there is under the current sort of arrangements and with the current practice, etc. Wh wh whose role is that? I think it's a combination between all of us sitting here with, with, with government and with industry. And we are doing this already, and industry are doing a lot on innovation. Um, but I think that, you know, we really need to tackle some of these issues, find solutions to the sort of sea lice issues, some of the other, the, the other issues that have been identified. And that will then free up potentially other locations that we currently would be concerned about. But if we've got those safeguards in place, they might be fine for, for expansions or, or new farms. There's issues to do with containment. Um, which would resolve a huge, you know, most of the issues that we're, we're concerned about. So there are other things happening and that are being investigated in other parts of the world that, again, we would like to maybe see some, um, some, some more trials and, 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 and lo looking into those sort of forms of innovation to see whether um, some of the issues can be resolved and that might free up potential for, for, for much more growth. But at the moment, I think it's, it's difficult to look at, at you know, growth targets without really understanding what the environmental issues would be for, for just trying to fire ahead with that, that kind of level and of And would there be a resource issue for SNH if there's a lot more work to do? Well, it, there would be a resource issue in terms of dealing with the applications. Um, as I say, um, we, we don't sort of link our monitoring specifically to, to consents and, and to, um, to fish farm development. So it's not that we would necessarily um, be expected to do more monitoring. Um, but yeah, we would obviously need to consider the, the, the you know, the, um, the, the time involved in commenting on applications, but that's just something we would have to try to factor in. Okay, thank you. Mark, do you want to come um, Yes, I mean, more applications will be more planning fees, but the big issue for us at the moment, of course, is planning fees are not ring-fenced, uh, within, even within the planning service, um, so, and local government is quite hungry for resources at the moment, so it's a concern. Uh, the fact that we're setting ourselves up to do more monitoring um, through our environmental management plan uh, conditions at the moment is, is also a concern. We are giving ourselves more work to do there, so an expansion. But and I'm I'm sorry, am I right in saying that you therefore do not get any resources specifically for that? You get the lump sum for the planning application, but that's, if you've got ongoing costs, there's no more income, is that's, that right? That's correct. Right. That's, that's correct, yes. Right. yes. Um, the monitoring is always a, an issue for planning authorities, enforcement being the, the obvious example. Um, I'd reiterate what Cathy was sort of saying. I mean, the industry have set up a, 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 have set a challenge, I think, to themselves and everybody else by saying, well, we'd really like to double capacity. But there is no, nobody knows the capacity of Scottish waters to absorb um, uh, that level of, uh, of, of, uh, of fish farming activity. We, we have a, a, a strange situation, I think, um, and I haven't really ever received a proper answer to this, that, of course... We have three coasts to Scotland, west, north, and east. North and east have a moratorium on fish farming. There aren't many moratoriums in the planning system um, because it's not really what the planning system is about. You know, fracking, nuclear power stations, I, you know, I don't know of many others. 
I've never had really received an explanation of why that continues to exist within Scottish planning policy. Do you think but that it, should but be it does mean that, of course, yes. everything is focused on the West Coast. Uh -huh. Should that be reviewed at some point, do you think? Well, I, yeah, I, I think it should be reviewed by, uh, by government um, before it's reviewed by industry. Because, of course, it could, you know, the planning system would give industry the opportunity to challenge that if they wanted to. Um, it's, it's a policy position that can be challenged, of course, um, perhaps through an application. Um, so I think th th there's, there is, a, there is a, um, a, an uncomfortableness uh, for us and that, you know, that basic work hasn't, um, hasn't been done. Um, I'm, I, th I think what, what has sort of come up a couple of times here is, is, is the need for a sort of more strategic plan. Um, I was sort of quite struck by the Norwegian model where they came up with a traffic light approach, which is green, amber and red. Interesting enough, uh, uh, green was go. <laughs> green, green was, yes, this is, this is suitable for further, um, further permissions. Amber was probably not suitable for further permissions. And red was not just stop, but red was actually draw back. Red was reduce the biomass in this area. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that strikes me as probably very relevant to the Scottish experience because I suspect there are parts on the west coast of Scotland where we actually have too great a loading already of fish farms. We have red areas, as it were, and we need to try and move that biomass to areas where we might be categorising them as green. But there's a huge amount of work to be, to be done there. And as I said before, my, my feeling two years into, into this job is that we're about 30 years too late. We have an awful lot of catching up to do. The industry's been around for a long time. And really, in 2018, we probably should have these answers already. And we're nowhere near. Um, it's, it's a lot of work to get there. Thank you. Uh, John Finney, and then come to Cathy, and then back to John. So uh, I'm conscious of the time. And I, I mean, it, it is interesting. We're, we're on question five. There's probably about 20 questions to go. And uh, I have uh, badly managed the time. So I'd trust everyone if they could keep their answers as concise as possible. Oh, so yes. Anne followed by John. <laughs> um, so I'm going to uh, try and speed that up by saying uh, we, we were asked and our submission of the 28th of March, questions five and six relate to uh, determination of unannounced visits um, in simplicity. So I'm going to the question five visits, so John, I think you'd asked around the, the impacts of 2030 resource and visits was, was what I had scribbled down. Uh, so question five of that response uh, provides a more detailed answer, uh, but that is important to reflect this is a live species with disinfection and disease protocols. Um, it's also um, facilities which don't always have, have uh, individuals at them and there is health and safety aspects. So it's a multiple approach for physical inspection. Regulatory control, though, um, is more than just physically turning up at a facility. Um, and oversight and regulatory conditions within licences <laughs> to enable a different way of assessing and ensuring compliance uh, feature uh, within um, our environmental suite and increasingly looking to do and use that as an increasing aspect as we move forward in, in our own uh, changing um, innovation as a regulator for this industry. So question five for visits, I hope that... that so it's the, it's the, sorry, it's our letter of response published um, by the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee uh, dated 28th of March 2018. Right. Thank you. And there are um, specific responses to that. In respect to resource, um, unlike um, CEPA, uh, unlike SNH and local authority, uh, we charge for applications and uh, to recover our costs. Um, and increasingly trying to be more effective at recovering our costs so that our grant and aid does not in any way um, be utilised in that regard. Uh, we also charge for inspection and regulatory effort um, and we have a published charging scheme um, which relates to the entirety of uh, our actions. Uh, we also do charge and can charge for monitoring. Um, so our ability to up our resource is directly linked to any increase within any sector. Um, more applications, more visits, more monitoring, uh, all of which we can charge for and recover across. And the Regulatory Reform um, Act introduced our new enforcement measures, two of which have the ability for us to recover course when we undertake enforcement action. Um, and we are now starting to commence the use of those tools. Um, so in terms of our ability to increase resource uh, to, to manage any um, industry growth, 
uh, industry will be paying for our ability to regulate them and to monitor them. So when I say enhanced monitoring, uh, I'm reasonably confident of our ability to get response and uh, charging back on that basis. Um, um, I'm going to bring John Finney in now, and then Cathy, you're probably going to get the first chance to answer this question. Thank you. It's, a, it's, a, it's a very brief question to Mr Harvey. I'm interested in your comments on the moratorium and, and in particularly the, the references to the Norwegian system. You alluded to the fact that uh, there are areas off the west coast that are in that red zone, in your opinion. Would you like to give us a, a determination of where some of these areas are on the west coast that would fit into a red zone using the Norwegian system, Mr Harvey? Um, I wouldn't. <laughs> Is <laughs> because I don't, I don't think I don't think we, 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 we have done the work. The the, the, the the supposition is that we have we have concentrations um, and the, it would help the industry if we were able to identify um, it, it, it's it's rather more the importance of identifying the green areas, I think, where where we, we, we feel that um, development should take place and the support that might be able to provide be able to be provided to to support that situation. So I think just to follow it up, for a green area, there's nothing to stop a environmental impact assessment being carried out on the wider area. Sorry to interrupt area. you, because I suspect this may intrude in other questions, but I was specifically interested in the, the, the red zone and the analogy with the, the system in, in Norway. And you said you're aware of concentrations. Are you able to say where these concentrations are then, please? Because surely that's just a matter of fact rather than opinion. Um, well, I don't. I don't think I can actually. I mean, there, there are areas. There are areas um, of the west coast where we have um, a, a large number of farms. We, they would obviously be a, a focus of attention. But of course, it, they but don't. Just for the they record, don't necessarily. Where are, these, where are these areas then? Oh well, we, we certainly have a we have a concentration of uh, um, fish farms in the uh, um, uh, south of Sky, for for example, um, uh, which actually. Well, we're, su we're subject to a recent refusal, but on, on, on uh, landscape I impact grounds. Um, now, that's an area that perhaps would be uh, uh, worth looking at further to see what capacity in environmental terms uh, that area has, notwithstanding um, uh, the, 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 landscape, the landscape issue. Um, but there are also areas of, of the West Coast which, which have not received um, uh, a large number of fish farm applications for a variety of reasons, operational reasons, I suspect, mostly. Maybe um, lease reasons as well. Okay. Uh, and that would also be a useful piece of information. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed. Come in briefly, and then I, I need to move to the yeah, next question. Yeah, just very briefly, really, in relation to the point that Mark made about the moratorium. I think, you know, the moratorium, as I understand it, was there because of the importance of some of the, the salmon rivers on the east coast, the north coast. And I think that, again, it would be worth looking at that, again, if there were, if there were good innovation that would, would you know, restrict the, the issues relating to escapes and sea lice then yes, there would be no reason to not open that up again. But without that, I think it would be quite risky to open up a whole new area uh, where we know there are sensitivities there from a wild fish perspective without those kind of safeguards in place. I'm going to move straight to the next question then. Thank you. Richard, uh, last. Um, welcome. Um, we basically have quite a number of, of, of fish farms. It's a growing business. We want to double it, but we have a problem. And the problem is the capture and bene beneficial use of the waste. And the Eclair Committee, of which I actually am a member, uh, understands the volume of waste, untreated waste, discharged discharge from fish farms into the marine environment is half the volume of human treated effluent of Scotland. My comment is, if any other organisation was dumping sewage in the sea in this scale, there would be a national outcry. So what um, and basically turning maybe to, to Anne Anderson. Uh, one aspect of CEPA's forthcoming sector plan, which she spoke about, is increasing the capture and beneficial use of the waste. How will this be done? What action will be taken? And what action can be taken on established sites? And how can we resolve it in five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> as quickly as possible. Um, uh, firstly, I would say that, and I think it is important, um, the, your, your opening um, point there, Richard, around uh, the, the human waste and fish waste, um, in, in, the, in the totality of it, is, it's apples and oranges in terms of how we control. Um, 
and using a combination of dilute and disperse and breakdown by animals and bacteria in the environment, um, fish farms and exposed dynamic locations. There are differing controls, and I certainly won't be able to give you the detail in five minutes, but certainly to give you a written response to that. Um, in terms of the ability to uh, move and to change, um, Cathy referenced, I think, in fact, we, we perhaps we all have done, around uh, technical innovation <coughs> and solutions. Um, and uh, th there are, and uh, across the globe, um, opportunities uh, which are proving um, to be able to capture um, solids, uh, organic load. We assess on the basis of um, the environmental capacity uh, to sustain, um, and that's absolutely critical uh, when we're looking at it. So protecting the environment and biodiversity by ensuring that the fish production is managed matched to the environmental capacity in which it operates. Um, where we have um, scenarios and, and, and reference to uh, locations that may not be better suited, um, there may well be technologies that allow those locations to be used, such as uh, if you capture organic load. Um, there are trials globally. Um, and uh, I think learning um, and testing is still going on. Uh, reference to containment technology uh, and concluding in that, uh, the balance of total environmental impact. You know, these are all questions, uh, as I say them, they're all questions that require evidence before we push and, and instruct and do, because consequences of one, um, to resolve one particular environmental impact may lead to other consequences, and it's about testing those uh, technologies and trials that are occurring. We are also discussing them and uh, exploring the use of them within Scottish coastal waters, uh, which is the key, because trials get to a certain point. Let's see it actually occur here and see what then that difference it then makes, particularly in locations where we are more concerned by. Cathy, okay. um, do you want to comment on that? Or? I don't think so. I think Anne has kind of covered the, the key yeah. points that you were asking about there. Yeah. Uh, if I can turn to the subject of wild fish. On the protection of wild fish, SEPA have said we're in the process of exploring with other regulators, in particular Marine Scotland, how we can, can contribute. This includes reviewing how the different policy and regulatory frameworks, including their own wide regulatory powers, can be used to better effect. What's the panel's view on um, what aspects of wild farm, wild fish, farm fish interaction does each member of the panel address in the consenting and regulatory uh, regime? Is there any aspects not being addressed adequately? And how will proposed changes improve the consideration of wild fish, farm fish interactions? And lastly, how would these changes to current practice be made? Uh, Quite a few uh, questions, yeah. Mark, you took an intake of uh, breath, so I'm assuming you wanted to answer that. Thank you. Um, well, the, the, we, the, the reason that we've, we're now um, using the environmental management plan conditions, so to, 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 which basically means that we're involved, we're, we're aware of the sea lice numbers within the, within the farm. That's, that's one set of data, uh, and recent um, announcements suggest that that data is likely to become public knowledge uh, uh, during the course of this year. Um, so that's, that's something we would, we would have anyway. And at the same time, a requirement for, for the operator of the individual fish farm to carry out relevant um, wild fish monitoring. Um, in, in the and while this is wild salmonid uh, monitoring um, that, that is relevant to that particular fish farm, um, and enables us to uh, look for any correlations um, that may occur between uh, sea lice numbers on the farm and uh, and issues with wild fish health, um, uh, depending on on, on the monitoring. Um, so that is that's that that at the moment is um, we feel the best we can achieve. It, it, it's a, it's a condition that uh, um, one of the things that was mentioned in the previous report, of course, was the use of the precautionary principle. I should just explain within the planning system, the precautionary principle, of course, would would mean oh we don't have enough evidence, we'll refuse the application. But before we refuse an application within a development management context, because we have to decide 
that there aren't conditions that are suitable to mitigate the issue in, in question. Uh, and we've come to the conclusion, and I, I have to say um, the uh, uh, DPEA through, through, uh, and their reporters have, have also come to the conclusion that this level of monitoring, or a conditional requirement for a level of monitoring of wild fish meets, the, um, meets that requirement. So we don't have to refuse the application, but we do need to ensure that the monitoring is carried out. So that's where we are at the moment with wild fish monitoring. I personally, it, it's very piecemeal because of the nature of planning applications. That's its problem. I would much rather that there was, uh, we were developing a much more um, uh, holistic database on, on wild fish numbers, interactions, activity, movements um, uh, for, for the whole of the West Coast. And that, of course, would help support this, this overall um, uh, planning picture that I think we've, we've, we've referenced before. It would be an integral part of that. So I, don't, I, hope, I hope that answers some of the, que some of the some questions of the, that, the that you, you, you put forward. Well, it's one of the questions I'd, I'd love to ask and get an answer to from everybody is, can wild fish and, and salmon farms coexist? Can they, can, you know, we seem to be, um, it's a bit like uh, America a number of years ago, um, uh, cows and, and sheep. Um, you know, far, uh, people, you know, cow guys didn't like the sheep farmers and, and they had a war. Um, and it seems sometimes a bit like this in, in, in this subject. Can they coexist? I think my job is to try and ensure that they can. Yes, I mean, that's what we do. We're, we're balancing development against uh, the environmental pressures. The, the issue, of course, is simply that in the natural environment on the West Coast, there was something in the region of 500 to a million wild fish, we think, you know, some, somewhere, in, somewhere in that region, historically. We now have 65 million farmed fish in the water. So the, 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 it, it, the interaction is, 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 is complicated by the numbers, and, we'll, and those numbers are likely to, in, to increase. Um, so it's, it's a question that the, the, the interaction and the effect is inevitable. Um, and <coughs> our job, obviously, is, is to try and work out how we can minimise the effect of, uh, of one on the other. Yeah. But um, raised sea lice numbers are an issue. Alex, I'm not sure whether you want to come in. Uh, can I just say to all of you, could, when, you're, when you're addressing this, could you just, w when we talk about salmon and rich taught salmon, it does actually, inc inc I think you should take into account sea trout as sea well. Trout. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, totally. Which should is said, slightly well, different. Fish. Alex, if you'd like to come in, right. and followed by Cathy and then Anne. Yes, thank you. Um, just to address the last question, can they coexist? Uh, yes, and, and as Mark said, but it depends on the amount of management focus and effort applied. And that's probably what's lacking. I think um, the interaction at the moment and the debate around it lacks focus. The, the first thing to look at is, is what can salmon farmers be held accountable for? What is the effect? And it is, it is the, a significant increase in the last burden on wild fish in the locality that wouldn't otherwise be there if the farm wasn't there. But the argument drifts off into survival and population status in rivers and everything else, and then you're off into correlations, and it becomes very polarised. There needs to be, a focus needs to be brought back to certainly monitoring the lice burdens on wild fish, because that is the other side of the interaction. If you focus simply on the numbers of lice on farmed fish, it, it, it's, it's meaningless, and it's been said before, I think, in front of the Eclair Committee, it's meaningless. If you take the recommendations that are available, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council recommends 0.1 adult female. Marine Harvest's manual advocates 0.2 adult females. A project in Norway in the Hardanga Fjord several years ago advocated 0.3. Our own legislation advocates 0.5, 0.4 is free at the moment. So it, it, it's all over the shop. It, you have to look at what's happening on this side and the other, the other being the wild fish lice burden. Integral to that needs to be, well, what are you going to do about it? How does that information feed back into the management of the farm? What is the trend analysis? And it will be trend analysis. I think the thing to recognise is that there is probably not a solution to this. It is an ongoing management issue because there is a huge complexity involved with a farm population, a wild population, the ecological dynamics of the parasite involved, and all the environmental fluctuations around it. It is close monitoring, effective management. Now, that is absent at the moment, or it has been left to corporate business decisions to be made. That needs to be brought into the, reg 
regulatory framework through management planning that I spoke about earlier. Yes, thanks. We get the clock behind, so short answers. Okay, well, I completely agree with everything Alex has said there. Um, uh, we, 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 we have come at this um, from the perspective of needing to give advice um, from a, a habitats regulation um, perspective for Natura sites, so for um, SACs that are either for wild salmonids or for freshwater pearl mussel, which are dependent on wild salmonids. Um, and in the absence of a kind of key regulator for looking at the interests of wild fish um, and, you know, really before that, the, the whole idea of environmental management plans was coming up through the local authorities, we kind of came to a very similar solution from the point of view of safeguarding um, SACs, which was the need for uh, a technical group to be set up to oversee monitoring, and that included the, the, the sweet netting monitoring of uh, sea lice burdens on wild fish, that really being the crux of this. Um, but then referring that back to if, if an issue was, was identified in terms of elevation of, of sea lice numbers on wild fish, then looking at the farms in the area to see, well, what's happening in those farms and is there a problem there? Um, and then needing to take, have, them, have a, some form of management plan that can then um, make changes to the way that those farms are being managed to cut the sea lice burden. Um, we're, we're getting some, it's taken some while to get to this place, but the group, the SAC technical group to oversee that discussion has now been convened by Marine Scotland. There is work going on to start to scope out the monitoring that's needed to hopefully give the kind of um, wider picture, certainly in terms of, um, of, of juvenile salmonid populations. We need to up the ante on the sweet netting on the wild fish and work out how that's going to be managed and who's going to pay for that. I know industry are already stepping forward in some cases to look at how they take that forward. Um, but it is a complicated sort of process to tie all this together. And I also think there's something there about um, looking at area the areas that we need to look at because it's not necessarily easy to relate the, the sea lice burden on the wild fish back to individual farms. We need farms to be thinking collectively on a, an area basis, um, perhaps at the sea loch level, about how they collectively um, provide a burden of sea lice that then might interact with, with the wild fish in that area. So there's, um, we are making progress, but, but we, we've still got quite a long way to go to make sure that it's um, regulatory, um, you know, enforceable as well. Was that the tripartite agreement rehashed? Uh, it was, it's moved from that, I think, but uh, yeah, very <coughs> much in, okay. in mind, yeah. Thank you. Anne? Uh, um, so I'm not, you know, I, I agree with what um, Alex and, and obviously I agree with the work that um, uh, Cathy has stated. Uh, I can see a quick yes and no yes in terms of that final um, uh, question by Richard around can they coexist, but it is with that range of um, appropriate practices to manage the, the sea lice burden. Uh, and it is not just the chemical solution, it is the multiple preventative and practical management and some of the technologies that have been raised and expressed before, ensuring that that is consistently done by the industry at the earliest opportunity. So the references Alex was making to the points of when you then instruct a treatment um, and ensuring that that is then delivered across every site in the same fashion, such that one treatment at one pen, never mind a multiple site, at the first response to manage the situation within that wider um, area. So, uh, d practical uh, monitoring and management. But yes, coexistence is possible and should be the case, but it is with all those other factors un under play. Thank you. Um, John, yours is the next question. It, it... Yeah, I, I'll make it brief, um, Convener, um, or briefer, um, because I, much of it's been touched on, and as it, the, the reference has been made to the cumulative effect of various things, and I, I was going to, to list three, and that's the Marine Scotland Science Fish Health Improvement <coughs> excuse me, Inspectorate's um, revised policy in the control of uh, sea lice, which has been referred to and is due for a new, uh, review in July. Um, <coughs> the commitment given by the producers, um, a voluntary commitment, um, connected with sea lice count, and the third one was SEPA's uh, developing sector plan. <coughs> and, excuse me. <coughs> and it was to ask if uh, you believe these are sufficient to regulate industry effectively going forward, uh, and if not, uh, what issues will remain a challenge? Now, I appreciate much of that's been touched on, but I don't think there's been reference previously to the voluntary changes announced by the producers. Um, I don't know who'd like to lead off on that. I mean, it seems the first question is a yes or no one, and then a short uh, list afterwards, maybe. Um, maybe I'm too hopeful. Anne? So in respect to the, the remit, which I'm responsible for, 
Um, I think yes um, to, to the short question around um, the ability to do and the sector plan approach and the work that we've got underway uh, and our ability then to regulate and control it because we've done the truth and evidence on those pilot situations. And so the aspect of cumulative effect and the ability to expand that across the entirety of the marine coastal waters, that's a resource challenge because it's a costly process. Um, again, I've re referenced our ability to charge, um, but far better uh, for all regulators and industry and the academics to collaboratively work together to get it done quicker would be the um, suggestion. And it certainly then is, is usable material for, for planning authorities and other regulators to identify uh, we, a, a go zone or a no zone in respect to fish farming. Um, the, the, the second part of the, the question, John? I, I talked about the SEPA's sector plan and the producers voluntary undertaking. So the, the producers have voluntarily um, agreed uh, uh, to release the information um, and uh, that, will, that will be occurring. Um, it's the detail, both um, the salmon and trout industry will be providing that information, ensuring that uh, those two different uh, provision uh, pieces marry up, uh, because they do collect slightly differently. Um, what if they don't volunteer. provide that information? They don't, they don't provide, well, there is a provision, there is a certain amount of information that is provided, having it publicly available and uh, consistent so that it can then be compared is the key point, um, and that is underway, um, whether that is then Sorry, under regulation. What, what if they don't? What if a producer well, says, I'm the, not going to publish? So in terms of, so, um, uh, we, we, we do not ask for sea lice information because we don't monitor fish health. So fish health inspected it and controls there. Should it be regulated? Um, as a regulator, um, to change behaviours, one thing to ensure it happens is you put it into regulation. Uh, whether it's in a licensing regime or whether it's in statutory baseline legislation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Does, that, does anyone else want to add to that? Or uh, Cathy, briefly, and just then we'll move on to Stuart with the next Very briefly, question. just to say that obviously the fish health inspectorate thresholds are set on the basis of the, the health of the farmed fish. So I think we just, you know, wanted to still uh, make that link to, and obviously local authorities have kind of picked up the mantle on, on this issue because there wasn't really a, another regulator with a clear um, mandate for, for taking that forward. But I think, I think probably there is still a gap there in terms of who's, who's really kind of setting that, that, uh, that, that level for the wild fish um, and how, we, how are we managing that within the system. Th thank you. Uh, Stuart, the next question is yours. Uh, thank you. I, I'm going to try and fairly briefly to just close off the issue uh, of wild farm, farm fish interactions. Uh, before getting into the detail, I, I wonder, and this is not a yes, no, it's a yes, no, or your question is hopelessly uh, oversimplified um, answer. Um, would the panel agree correlation is not indicative of causation? In other words, if you have a correlation between two things happening in two domains, it can be an interaction between those domains or it can be a further external factor that they share between the two. So correlation does not tell you that there's an interaction. It's not a causation. Is that a correct statement? Yes, I'm getting nodding heads, Convener, so I'll just simply uh, move on because I think that's quite an important point in where we are. <laughs> uh, the, the panel all nodded, yes, you're quite uh, right. Cathy didn't, Cathy's dissenting. Well, I, no, I did nod, but can I just say that um, that, that is the case, and we wouldn't say that because we'd identified an issue, we would automatically link it to a specific cause, but I think a lot of what we're doing in terms of advice is taking into account precaution and risk in relation to the obligations that we have, and therefore we don't necessarily have to have complete proof that something is linked, but we have to have some management measures there to... To, to avoid harm and to take in, uh, into account that risk. Uh, that, that, that's helpful, and I'm not trying to uh, suggest that there is not an interaction. I'm just, it's just about the language and how we deal with all this. Can I, can I just move on though? And uh, uh, the, the, one of the difficulties, it seems to me, about this whole issue and the different players that there are, and we've just had the first reference to who's responsible for health, for example, in, in today's panel. Um, there seem to be three sets of people who would have an interest in the interaction. The farms and the customers for the farms who want to 
sell with a good environmental message, wild fish interests, obviously, and local communities and communities more widely. And I just <coughs> wonder, for each of them, is it clear to them how they can find out about wild fish, uh, farm fish interactions? Because I suspect it's not at all clear, um, especially as we've heard from the panel, that there are gaps in the knowledge anyway. So for these particular stakeholders, would it be clear where to go and get definitive answers to questions they might have? Uh, Anne? No. <laughs> right. Oh, that's Not clear. I think that is, uh, you know, it is across too many different layers and actually, you know, the information gap is, is there. So not even would you find every question being capable of being answered. Um, I think it's probably, a, a, you know, in terms of evidence on, on wild fish and interaction. Mark, could, could Mark. I just, could I just um, add to that, slightly off where you, the question was, was going, but of course, we, we do recognise that, of course, it's in everyone's interest that sea lice are kept to a minimum. There's no body involved in this debate that doesn't care about the sea lice burden. It's a big issue for the producer, it's a big issue for the consumer, big issue for the retailer, big issue for the planning authority, big interest issue for uh, consultees uh, and, and environmental protection uh, bodies. So I, I, th I think, it, I think that's, it's an important, important to recognise that everyone is working the way in the industry is spending a fortune on new methods of controlling sea lice. The issue probably is that the degree of success in controlling that sea lice is the issue that gives us our measure of risk in terms of wild fish interactions. So we're, we're quite comfortable, everyone's working together in the same way. It's, it's much more the degree of success that's being achieved that lends the sort of edge to the, to the, the, to the regulatory need um, because it, it's, at the moment it's not always very successful um, and that is causing issues of an environmental nature. Alex, you wanted to come in? Yes, thank you. It's just, um, just to add to, to the, the comment about do people know what's happening, I think it's also important that people know what efforts are being made because we are dealing with the uncertainties and the unpredictabilities. And um, just, because you don't just because there isn't necessarily a, a good outcome doesn't mean that there hasn't been a sincere and determined attempt to achieve that. And I think that's important uh, to be recognised. And, and it's not to say that, that industry should or shouldn't be let off the hook. But you know, coming back to the very first question, the challenge for the regulatory regime is to enable those efforts to be properly directed, not only to achieve the outcomes, but also to have uh, adequate accountability and reporting for the people who are interested. So, uh, Just can I pick up on precisely what you said there, that uh, everybody acting in good heart to address the problem is not in and of itself the point, it's the outcome. So in other words, sincere efforts made to address the problem are not enough to influence how we regulate and manage the industry. I'm, and I'm getting a nodding head to that. Yes, yeah, no, yeah. I agree. I, That's I agree. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Stuart, I, th I think that covers everything I want to. Um, and if you keep it short. I would, I would just say that it is one aspect, and I think you know, it is important. You, you opened by asking um, the, the correlation causation. Um, it is one pressure, without a doubt, on the picture, but I've made reference to change in climate and other pressures in other industries, um, and it's important not to look at the totality of, of potential pressures on the situation in respect to wild fish, be they salmon or trout, and I think it is really important that, that, that there is clarity on that range and that each of those aspects are being handled, tracked and addressed um, such, such that the totality, um, because there is no definitive one or other, it's, it's the combination of... Thank you for indulging me. Um, Edward. It won't always happen, Anne. Um, no. uh, Jamie, yours is the next question. <clears throat> Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning, panel. I'm acutely aware we're uh, only halfway through our line of questions, so I'll try and consolidate the theme of where I'd like to go next, and that's around oversight of the industry. Um, and by that, I mean growth plans for the industry, the speed of growth, and the locations of growth. Can I ask the panel? briefly, individually, who do you currently think uh, provides oversight of the industry's expansion at the moment? And secondly, who do you think 
should be in charge of oversight of the industry's expansion? Um, I'm going to give you each chance to answer that question, sir, but I would ask you to keep it as brief uh, as possible. Um, Alex, do you want to start on that, and then I'll go to Mark, Anne, and come back to Cathy at the end. I think at the moment it's, it's, it's tricky because of the fragmented nature of, of, of the regulatory framework that we're working with. Uh, arguably, uh, Mark and his colleagues in, in local authorities uh, have, have a, a lead role in determining what can happen where. I think there needs to be a better dialogue between regulators, government, and the industry itself. I don't think, you know, at the moment there's a little bit too much of an us and them um, relationship, I think, between regulators and industry, and I think that needs to be brought closer together to address, frankly, all of the uncertainties and, and, and all the questions we want answered, a lot of which will only be able to come from industry in terms of their, their, their ambitions, the, the kind of innovations that they are looking at, uh, the investment uh, opportunities and, and uh, ambitions they have there as well. So it, it's, I don't think it's a single party who can do it. It needs to be a, a collaborative conversation. Um, and, and, and the industry need to be a central part of that. Uh, ultimately, you would expect the likes of government to be closely involved and the local authorities, but ultimately it's all the stakeholders. Whether you choose a, le a lead authority or whether you have it more as a, as, as a dialogue between a number of parties, I don't, I don't quite know yet. I think the only thing that we need to do, though, is not to make sure that industry is, is part of that and it is not left simply to the regulatory authorities because we need that input from, from, the, industri from the industry side. Um, Mark, and I, I'm going to, sorry, encourage you all to... to to concise answers, if I may, Mark. Um, I think the I think the appropriate system is the planning system. We've got it in place already. Uh, it, we we need to use its spatial uh, aspects uh, to to a greater extent to identify um, suit, suitable areas. Um, and I slightly disagree with Alex, but but only because going back to my point that it's late in the day. Um, this is a process that probably should have been get, begun a long time ago. It may be that local authorities need to step forward and provide that regulatory um, clarity um, uh, at, at, this, at this stage. Yes, we obviously need to talk to the industry and so forth, but we don't want to get into a five-year discussion period where, where nothing is done for uh, another long period of time. Okay, Anne. Um, I think I'd just refer to some of the previous answers around the, the cumulative effect aspect. So each part of the, of the regulatory landscape is looking at the impact in that wider context. The heat mapping that um, Marine Scotland are doing in terms of lice to get to ever closer to the point of that red, amber, green approach that's undertaken in Norway, which is sea lice and, and sea lice monitoring. Um, I think one of those aspects is the layering of that total picture. And then that definitely features the, the comment um, Mark made around spatial planning. Um, having the ability then to be able to identify clearly viable, effective and efficient and sustainable places to farm fish in its context with those other commercial and recreational users and of course protection of the habitat within the environment. So it's managing the totality of that, including the commons. And it's getting to that, com that point, not just site by site, but the, the totality, because of course it is, it is, it has to be taken in its in its full holistic context, um, and it's informing that piece uh, in terms of that spatial planning approach. Cathy, do you want to come in briefly? Very briefly, um, I would agree with the others. It's down to planning. Um, however, Mark, I think it's referring more to terrestrial planning because obviously that's the way we we we, we mostly deal with aquaculture at the moment. But I would just. So mentioned marine planning in terms of the other uses of the marine environment are, are really managed through that mechanism and I think we need to get better integrating the way we deal with aquaculture through the marine planning system as that evolves. We've got the national marine plan, we're now evolving our regional marine plans. We need to make sure that aquaculture is a part of that dialogue in working out how, how those regional marine plans will, will, will set out such spatial areas for different uses. If I, if I could thank the, thank the panel for those answers. I think what worries me and what strikes me from the responses though is the concept that planning is somehow at the centre of all of this. Now, planning is a reactive uh, duty. It is reacting to uh, applications from the commercial sector, the private sector. What I'm getting at and what nobody answered really is who should have oversight of the future direction of the industry in terms of its growth strategy and its locations, uh, where, where the growth will be and the, sp and the speed and rate of growth. If uh, we look, for example, to and this is my second question, is the Norway model, where they've taken a far more top-down approach with the uh, Aquaculture Act, uh, which uh, basically creates 
the introduction of the licensing scheme. Uh, I think others will have questions on uh, the benefits of, of that or how it could, may, could work in Scotland. But do you think there should be a more top-down approach in Scotland from government level uh, uh, in terms of legislation or strategy or a single government agency which leads the charge as opposed to this very disparate and in fact quite uh, difficult to pin down an agreement uh, any particular uh, agency which should have oversight of the industry. I'm still struggling to see uh, who's leading the, leading the charge in terms of the strategy. Uh, I'm going to bring Mark in and then maybe ask if, if one of the other panel members would like to, to probably argue the counter, which is the national one. So I'll get, bring Alex in on the basis that Mark's probably going to argue local. Mark. Um, but I wasn't so much to go, I was going to clarify. Don't forget within the planning system, there's two, two aspects to the Scottish planning system. One is the bit I work with, and you're quite right, the, the reactive uh, applications part. But uh, you'll have upset an awful lot of my colleagues <laughs> back in Inverness <laughs> who work on the uh, development plan side. Now, that is the strategic spatial part of planning, and many would argue is, is the heart of the planning system uh, in, in Scotland. And the argument we're putting forward is, is that could take a much uh, stronger role and could would provide the coordinating at national, well, uh, local authority by local authority um, uh, uh, area um, picture. In national terms, obviously national legislation, national policy um, feeds into that process. And I, I, would, I would agree with you that I, 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 I would follow your uh, comment that I, I think perhaps more could be done at a national level. It, it does help when national policy kicks off a, 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 a policies that the, 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 the local authority can follow at, it, at, its, at, at its own level. But no, I, I, I think it's the other part of planning, it's the development plan side that needs to uh, uh, be brought forward into this. Alex. I would just say that I think we need to be careful about the, the, the focus on spatial elements here. The marine environment uh, is one that already is, is business is based on, on coexistence because the the impacts and the effects and the interests of various businesses usually extend way beyond their, their development footprint. And if you start to get too high on, on spatial elements, you rapidly run out of space. So marine planning is probably going to be more a function of managing coexistence and managing interactions than it is ever going to be about spatial apportionment. The other point about, about long-term planning for an industry as dynamic as, as, as aquaculture means salmon farming is that the rate of innovative change can often make plans redundant very quickly. The industry's technological development proceeds at a far greater pace than, than, than reviews of plans and agencies and things like that. And you could, you could look back 30 or 20 or 30 years to Sorry. the development of the industry and see, well, where are sites where were sites then, why were they there, where are they now, and why are they here now? And would we have, a com would we have foreseen that? 20 years ago or 10 years ago and how long, you know, how long is the plan going to be that, that we want to put in place. So I think there's always a, a, an element of evolutionary change associated with green businesses, partly because of the nature of the environment, the, the, the extent of the interests and the impacts that you're talking about, but also, again, the, the rapid rate of development of the businesses themselves. Just something to be wary of. Mm. It's more of an observation as a final point, is that it is worth noting, though, that the Norwegian Atlantic salmon farming industry grew by 115% over the same period as we grew at 20 odd percent. So there is disparity there. So notwithstanding the, the rate of uh, technological change that you refer to, there still is a fundamental flaw in how this market has developed in Scotland. What we're trying to do, achieve as a committee here is, is look at how we can avoid those pitfalls in the future so that we can facilitate adequate and respectful growth. Thank you. Uh, Peter, next question. Yeah, I want to, to, to look at what we can learn possibly from other countries, and I, I think Norway has to, has to be the focus of much of that. We've got to recognise that they, their industry is eight times the size of our industry. It's rapidly growing. It's grown a million tonnes in the last ten years, from a quarter of a, one and a quarter million tonnes production to two and a quarter million tonnes production. So it is huge in comparison, and yet they seem to manage to, to, to regulate it better than we do. Um, we're told that no fish farms are located near migratory fish, wild fish migratory routes. Fish farms that lose fish, escaped fish, must be caught in the Norwegian situation. And we've already heard a wee bit of from, from Mark about the traffic light system. So my question is, 
What can we learn from particularly the Norway experience and maybe Faroes and other areas as well that we could use to more effectively regulate the industry in Scotland? Um, I'm going to start off with Anne and, and maybe ask if you could limit it to a, to a couple of points each if you want to come in on that and then if there's any we've missed out we'll pick them up at the end, Anne. So at the risk of uh, repeating myself, um, the, uh, the review that we've been undertaking within SEPA has included all um, global fish farming and, and, and ensuring they're informed not just by other regulators, wherever they happen to be in the hemisphere, uh, but taking the aspects of fish farming, uh, being very closely watching what happens within um, Norway, uh, within Canada, within Chile, within Faroe Islands, and within Iceland, you know, so, so close to home in terms of the European and specific species, but also looking at uh, fish farming in the global context uh, and, and identifying the practices, um, exchanging information, and that has included um, study and uh, field trips to, to better inform uh, our um, future regulatory controls in this area. Mm. Um, there are, again, it's the, there are locational specific aspects, temperature specific aspects, so, so what is usable and transferable. Um, and what is the best fit. Um, that dialogue uh, has been continuing for, for a number of years, uh, so it's not certainly something that is just new to our approach, but certainly over this last year we have done an intensive assessment globally uh, to ensure that we are ensuring that, that Scotland and it's Scotland's uh, regulatory approach um, is keeping and pushing and better yet, yeah, leading. Uh, in terms of uh, regulatory and environmental protection controls. So, I mean, having said all that, what, what specifically have you learned or what specifically are you going to do different in the, in the near future because of what you've, you've just been, uh, you know, outlining you've been looking at? So, it would be wrong of me to be able to, um, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for final policy decisions and legal checks and balances, um, and that's the process of, of imminent. Um, I, I did indicate we're, we're going to be publishing at the end of June um, so I am literally days away from getting formal um, conf confirmation of some of those points. Um, and, the, and thereafter, we will then be announcing um, that regulatory framework. It is a year's long work, um, and therefore we're right at the end of it. Uh, the process that leads us to today commenced you know, midway through uh, mm. that, that process. Um, one of the key things, though, is, is, is actually ensuring what are the lessons that have worked to lend itself to a better environmental outcome. Um, you know, um, and, and therefore, are they directly transferable and usable within Scotland? Made reference to use of technologies elsewhere and testing them within Scottish waters. How do we enable that? How do we encourage it? Um, and that is very much the process uh, that we're undertaking. Okay. Mark. I, I think I would re reiterate the, the, the big lesson that seems to be um, from the international examples I've seen is, is this question of providing a, a, a industry with a with a clearer map of where they should uh, um, concentrate their their activities I think that's that would be hugely helpful and it's hugely helpful to the the regulator as well it doesn't stop and this is perhaps where we have an advantage we, we do have the application part of the planning system as well if the industry want to challenge it that's the route they go down you make an application in an area that perhaps you know we've indicated we're not so comfortable with and make their case that can still happen but generally, I think everyone would be, be a huge benefit to have done some of the environmental mapping, as it were, that identified those areas which are acceptable and those aren't. Cathy mentioned the SAC areas on the west coast. I mean, we know the north, north and east coast have got some wonderful rivers that we don't want to have any impact on. But on the west coast, we have our SAC rivers as well. Um, uh, and uh, we, we think they should be protected also. I, I, I just make the observation for clarity: there are SAC rivers on, on the east coast as well as well as the west coast. In fact, a, a lot of the rivers on the east coast are SAC, either for species in river or within the Firth, from seals to to pearl mussels to to other species as well. Sorry, Alex, and then Kathy, if I could ask you to be brief. Very briefly, um, what can we learn? Bespoke legislation, rather than the somewhat hodgepodge that we have here at the moment. Um, effective review and a management focus. Therefore, they can accommodate changes and issues as they arise. 
we have to remember that planning can only address the activity, not the manner in which that activity is undertaken. And it is the management of the activity usually that either makes it harmful or less harmful in environmental terms. So you can't always plan on the basis of, of the activity. You need to be able to review the way in which the activity has been undertaken. That is key, and that, I think, is, is emphasised far more in the Norwegian system than we have it here. Cathy. Okay. Uh, well, from my understanding of things that are happening in Norway, I would say one one that we were interested in is, is the way that they, um, at a kind of regional level, um, identify good sites. That's the spatial planning um, aspect that we were talking about before. I think they, they look for good sites and then they basically offer those sites up for, for leasing to companies who then compete with each other to, 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 to choose those suitable sites. So I think that that's something we could look at here. Um, it would need a change to the way we currently operate, but it, it might be beneficial. Um, innovation, they, they do a lot with, with sort of eco-green licensing um, and we've, we've been hearing um, within our organisations about some of the things that Norway are doing and now are thinking about trying to bring some of their, their Scottish sites um, on the likes of, you know, closed containment on, on offshore um, barge type structures. So you, you're, you're, you're still farming at sea, but you're, you are completely contained. Um, and then there's also something around community benefits in terms of the way that the um, communities get funding back from the leasing uh, arrangements. And I think that, that, again, is something that would be interesting to look at in Scotland. Mm, thank you. Peter, does that, does that answer your question? I, I, I would just ask Cathy to, to, to focus in a wee bit on how they control sea lice numbers. I mean, they seem to be more, more successful. Their, their, tar their target levels are a lot lower yeah. than, than our target levels, and they seem to be able to achieve that. Have you any comment as, as to how they do that differently? I, I'm not close to the, the, the actual arrangements that they make, but I wonder whether by having a, you know, a stricter target that, that that's just driving the innovation and, and, and the, the practice, essentially. Um, but it would probably be better to ask someone from Marine Scotland that, that question. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Colin, yours is the next question. Thanks very much, Convener. Can I, can I turn now to the issue of um, funding for research? And can I ask each of you if you could let the committee know um, what funding your organisation um, provides for, for, for research and innovation projects relating to, to salmon farming, including um, assessments of wild fish stocks? And if, if I may, I could say, could, could I just target you to, to make those as generic comments, not, not to go through each individual uh, modelling process that, that's been funded, so just a generic process of what you're doing, because otherwise I think we'll be short of time. So, Cathy, would you like to start and we'll work along the... Uh, well, for example, we've been a partner, a director on the Scottish Aquaculture Research Forum for many years. Um, just over the last five years, we've contributed around £140,000 towards projects looking into, um, you know, different aspects of sustainable um, development of the industry. Um, that, unfortunately, that group is, is coming towards an end. We're looking into how we can sort of channel that collaborative research going forward. Um, we, we obviously do um, other work we're currently contributing. We're about to contribute to the work I mentioned earlier on juvenile salmonid monitoring, along with SEPA and uh, Marine Scotland. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot. We can provide more detail if you would like individual sort of examples of the sort of work that we're, that we're doing. I think that would be helpful. Alex? Yes, we contribute um, funding for research across the scope of the aquaculture sectors. Um, we, uh, like, like SNH, we, we participate on the Scottish Aquaculture Research Forum, but we also uh, contribute and fund uh, in, to individual projects. We like to co-fund and collaborate often with industry or other agencies, uh, and, and the scope can be anything from um, community benefit through to wild farm fish interactions and, and, uh, and technical aspects. Um, the key thing for us is, is, is enabling. It, it, it's looking at, at opportunities that, that will have a commercial legacy and then can be taken up by, by further funding by other agencies or by industry itself. Okay, Mark? Um, other than uh, uh, officer time taken in monitoring and so forth, we don't fund research. Anne? Yeah, we have a very limited amount of money to fund research. Uh, uh, we, we do have the um, intellectual property and then the laboratory analysis, so it tends to be in-kind support. Um, there are, and like, like Cathy stated, happy to provide you the details of the various uh, projects, some of which I have made reference to that are underway uh, with collaboration with both industry, other regulators and academic institutions. Thank you. Colin. So you, you've mentioned collaboration with the industry, but do you think that, that, that fish farm operators in Scotland should 
contribute more towards research? And if so, how do you think that would work in, in practical terms? Anne? So I think there is actually quite a high level um, of uh, research uh, contribution, um, SAIC, um, in terms of the innovate, and I believe they're, they're, they're in front of you next week, uh, do have a high uh, component of industry um, funding to, to, to identify. Um, I think the, the most successful uh, projects do include that combination of factor, regulator, business and academic um, to give a, a better and stronger and, and, and more evidence-based outcome. Um, I think that is really important. Um, the Norwegian model has some interesting um, expectations built into it around um, innovation that directly requires the drive for um, and that le is led by government. Um, so there are other there are other uh, processes globally that um, are used that we do not use within Scotland. Could you just touch on that? So the Norwegian model is to is to, is to, to have a contribution to an agriculture research fund. Do you think there's sufficient investment in research in Scotland at the moment? I'm not in a position to be able to say a yes and no to that. There is a range of it, and I think ensuring that it is actually joined up um, and highly visible. Um, and importantly, that what money is then being used isn't being duplicated. Um, so uh, I wouldn't want to be able to, nor could I, um, give a yes no uh, response to that. Um, Cathy, do you want to? Uh... I would actually probably give a, a, a no answer in terms of is there enough money. I think the, the Eclair report very helpfully highlighted a, a huge long list of evidence gaps. Um, most of which we would recognise as, as being high priorities, and I just don't think between uh, ourselves here we have we have the anything like the amount of, of resource that would be needed to try to prioritise those and start to tackle those. So I think there is there is an issue there in terms of um, funding to answer some of those really key research gaps that we keep coming back to, um, and it would it would be great to try to to, to make some progress. Should that extra funding come from the industry itself? Yeah. I think I think I think as as Anne said, the industry are already putting money into research, but I think perhaps um, be useful to try to think about how we make best use of, of, of that funding that's there and what are the key um, evidence gaps that we really need to focus on now. Okay. Does that, I mean Alex Mark? Do you, do you want to add to that, or, or or are you happy to leave it at that? I'm just going to. Um, so we had a response from Scottish Government um, on uh, recent applications, just, just to highlight where, where we sort of are with the research. Um, it comes up with a clear statement, salmon agriculture can result in elevated numbers of sea lice in open water, and hence in some circumstances is likely to have an adverse effect on population of wild salmonids. However, the magnitude of any impact from sea lice arising from farms in relation to the overall mortality levels of sea trout or salmon populations is not known. That, that's from... That's from the Scottish Government. It just strikes me that that indicates that there is quite a serious dearth of, of data um, this far on into, into Scotland's salmon industry history, as it were, uh, and activity. It's, it's a fairly fundamental piece of research which obviously hasn't occurred. It's not possible for government officials to assist a planning authority in, uh, in providing any information on that, on that important material consideration for us. So I, I, would, I would suggest that funding is needed for industry, government, um, uh, combination possibly, in order to bridge that sort of a gap. But I think that's a, that is quite a, a glaring gap within, uh, within the current situation given that it's 2018. Just add, um, in relation to what Mark has said, uh, there are some very substantial sums floating around because a lot, of in, a lot of your research is being undertaken by companies servicing the industry as well. So if you, if you add up the totality of what's being spent, I suspect it's fairly significant. There is, uh, I would agree though, uh, possibly a direction more towards the technical side rather than the management side. And things like the wild fish farm interaction, the wild uh, and farm interaction that we, we keep coming back to, um, I'm not convinced there is a solution as such that, re that research will, that will, will, will address, but what we can certainly look to do is to, is to put greater funding towards piloting management um, pra you know, practices, novel practices, innovative relationship and collaboration, that kind of thing. You know, Im improving the relationship between the industry and its stakeholders through interactive um, you know, pilots and things like that. I think there's been a, there's been a gap there that, that could do with a bit more resource. Thank you. That's probably a good place to leave that and move on to the next set of questions, which is Fulton McGregor. Thanks, Camille. 
around the funding uh, of regulation. And I'd just like to start by asking the fish farm operator payments for licences, um, in your opinion, cover the costs that your organisation uh, accrue in regulating the sector? Answer that. It sounds like a yes or no answer. Um. <laughs> Get me shot here. Um, the, the fee, the maximum fee for a fish farm application is approaching twenty thousand pounds. That's the application fee, so the planning application fee, um, which sounds a considerable amount of money. Um, it probably covers the. Um, it's one of the situa few situations in planning where it probably covers the initial um, uh, cost of determining the application. Um, the point was made earlier, does it cover ongoing monitoring? Well, I can't answer that question at the moment because I'm not sure what level of monitoring um, is required. But there is no other fee that can be drawn on for that, so that £20,000 will have to cover uh, ongoing monitoring for the planning authority as well. Um, so that's a reasonably positive answer, but we're perhaps at the negative tail end. Um. Um. Again, uh, we have uh, ability to charge, so we have a published charging scheme. The intent is for us then, therefore, to be able to balance the effort we expend in our <coughs> industry. So the, the more volume of applications, the, the higher the um, uh, fee component then is. And each individual uh, processing, right down to inspection and, uh, as, I, as I referenced earlier, our ability to recover some of our enforcement actions, which is a new um, ability. Uh, under two different um, powers, um, under the, the, the new enforcement suite of, of, of tools that we have. Um, so we do have cost recovery, uh, and the industry do pay for that. And, and likewise, that is the case in undertaking monitoring um, and our ability to uh, charge for, for those um, activities. So, so can I just ask, Anne, because it's, it's probably for yourself, one of the other questions I, I have is, why are, why are there currently no SEPA monitored firms, if you like, and do you think that affects the compliance? I'm sorry, I didn't... SEPA monitored farms, is, why is there none of them specifically? So um, we undertake um, uh, a process of uh, risk assessment where we target our monitoring effort. Um, companies, um, re regardless of the regime in which they're operating, um, undertake and report their own monitoring. Um, part of our regulatory control is advising when they're going to undertake particular studies such that we have the ability to go and regulate uh, the actual monitoring exercise and capturing uh, data. Uh, and the laboratory and the, the use of laboratory analysis is all under accredited schemes. Uh, validation of results uh, occurs in that process too. So it's a combination of operator modelling um, and then uh, oversight, audit and compliance and uh, enforcement-led uh, uh, monitoring by ourselves as a, as a regulator. Alex, do you want to answer uh, as far as the fees that are raised in relation to your licences? Yes. Well, I mean, we're a different organisation. We're not a regulator. We're acting in landowning capacity, and we grant rights once all the, the necessary consents have, have been secured. Um, as such, we don't, we don't charge for an application fee for a lease, but we charge an ongoing rent. Um, that that rent is derived from an independent review carried out for the se at a sector level every five years. It's currently £27.50 per harvested gutted weight tonne for fish farmed in the mainland. And there's a 10% discount on that if fish are farmed in the Outer Isles. Um, so it's an ongoing uh, annual charge. Yes, it covers our costs, um, but that's not its purpose. Its purpose is to return um, revenues to, to the Scottish Consolidated Fund. Yeah, um, okay, yeah, yeah, just to, to uh, round off, convener, I wonder if the, uh, the panel uh, could give us an answer on how they, f they feel that regulators in Scotland could work more effectively together. And I wonder when you're given an answer, if you think it's appropriate, um, you can make reference to your thoughts on um, a system of auction licences such as in Norway, um, such as we see in Norway. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy for the panel each to give a, a point on that. That's my final question. Who'd like to kick off on that? Um, Mark, you look the other way, so that must yes. mean you want to. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I, actually, to be honest, on, on the licences, I really don't think I've, um, uh, I, 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 there's, there's, there's much I can say. Um, you, you, first question was, was about how regulators would, would work more effectively would, together. Yeah. Would work effectively together. There was one point that just came from, from what Alex and, uh, and Anne and, uh, and Cathy have been saying. 
perhaps an area where we do need to look at um, for improvement is we, we've all talked about monitoring. Alex has sort of pointed out that that may be a really important part of uh, future, future uh, regulation. Um, at the moment, we, we're probably quite weak on coordinating monitoring of uh, individual farms because obviously our interest in them tends to be drawn to our particular attention uh, at, at a particular time. Um, I think perhaps that there is a need for us to look at what each uh, other, other body is doing in respect of an individual farm to make sure that our, our approaches are, um, are absolutely coordinated. Um, it's quite early days on that, uh, on that front though, I have to say. Anne, would you like to... Um, I think um, collaboration in terms of sharing of information and data sets. Um, so, so when we undertake um, our surface, um, and last year was a focus in the Shetland um, area of uh, fish farming, uh, those uh, conclusions and uh, reports are then published. So they are available in terms of those bigger, wider surveys. Individual sites and individual uh, um, information provided by site is um, submitted to ourselves. We, we, we do publish uh, the results of that, uh, of those assessments. And sharing and linking those pieces together is, is actively being progressed at the moment. It is around making sure everybody has access to, to help inform uh, their particular regulatory actions. Uh, it, there is also the need to have, and, and Cathy indicated, uh, some of the joint um, study work. Uh, this year, a uh, campaign uh, which is uh, and a study of uh, electrofishing across Scotland um, undertaken by Marine Scotland, led by Marine Scotland, but um, uh, active um, uh, tripartite uh, delivery with SNH and SEPA. That again, having, that, having every bit of data available for each um, uh, individual regulator and, of course, for the public uh, to have access to see is uh, very much part of um, the, the, you know, the industry being part of that too. Yeah. Uh, Cathy, do you want to say anything? I mean, I, sorry, I'm not sure, Anne or Mark, you, you, you'd covered the issue that Fulton asked about auctioning licences from a... From a uh, do, 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 I maybe give you a chance to think that one through and come back, Cathy. Um, well, I think, I think that's similar to what I was um, mentioning that we'd heard about from the Norwegian experience, and I, I think it needs a lot more thinking in terms of how that might operate in, in Scotland, but certainly the basis for that would be having that clearer picture of where the suitable locations are and having that sort of joint discussion between industry and all the regulators um, and communities as well, actually, um, at a very early stage before you identify what those lease areas might be. Um, but I can see benefits in that. We just take a bit of thinking about how that would tie in with our, you know, with with the ability to regulate. We've looked through lots of sort of pieces of work recently at the the regulatory regime, whether the, the, we had the independent consents review, looking at ways that that, that 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 process could be streamlined. I think it was pretty hard to find. Um, you know, major changes to the way we do things in, in Norway. They obviously have similar numbers of bodies contributing, but they just have a, a sort of front-facing main um, body that the, the, the application goes to, and then they, they do the, the consultation sort of um, behind behind a door, as it were. Um, so I don't think that's really that different in terms of the, the way that the, the system works. Um, one thing that I mentioned earlier that I think would be good to consider again, it might need some changes, but is, is the way it relates back to monitoring again, but how we collaborate in relation to the, the kind of area management of fish farms. So thinking about, say, a sea loss scale or, a, you know, a, an area um, and all the fish farms within that area, what is the monitoring telling us? What does that then mean for the management of those individual farms within an area? And maybe we need to think about how we, how we can do that better as, as a group of, of regulators and advisors. Um, I'm going to be very brief, and I'll give you each chance to sorry, come in on the auctioning of licences. Alex, do you want to...? Yes. Um, if I may, just, just very quickly, the, <coughs> on the regulatory side, Norway has an overarching piece of legislation, the Aquaculture Act, which brings all the... Dis it is multi-agency, but they, they, their relationship is governed by the terms of the Aquaculture Act. That's what we're missing here. And, and Cathy mentioned the independent consent review that was undertaken in 2016. That refers to that, and there's a proposed solution in that regard. Coming to the, the, the auctioning of licences, um, it depends on the value that you put on, 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 on leases and licences. Uh, in our case, we look to have the rent that we charge on a lease reflect the business that is undertaken across the ground. If you start to auction off leases or licenses, 
are you still reflecting the value of the business that's going to be undertaken, or are you creating a separate asset market in its own right that will be subject to its own sort of supply and demand? And, and at the moment, there's there's a huge demand for for new sites in Scotland. Would that would you get a sort of you know property price explosion in terms of the prices that are going to be offered for those? And does that necessarily reflect the value of the business? And what's important in reflecting the value of the business is is that free and fair to all those who might wish to undertake it? Because obviously, if it, the prices go up, you're talking about the bigger companies you know being in the game. And, and others being excluded. Um, we are dealing with a consolidated industry that is largely composed of, of, of large multinational companies, but not exclusively so. So I think we have to be careful that we don't sort of, the regulators by adopting such a measure don't automatically start consolidating in their own right. You know, that, that's up to industry to work itself. We need to make sure that we are fair in reflecting the value of what is being offered in terms of what's being charged for it. A, a brief comment, Mark and Anne. You don't have to. It, no, it was merely to say, I, I think the, the auction system, of course, it has to be um, uh, supported by certainty for the industry. You have to know what you're bidding for. And, and in fish farming, you need to know that you're bidding for a site that is actually going to end up as uh, producing fish. Um, so it, 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 we're not there at the moment um, by, by some, some degree, I would suggest. Okay. Anne? I have nothing to add, but I would, I would agree with what has been stated by my colleagues. Okay, I think Fulton, that that, uh, that that brings us to the end of our questions, um, and uh, I'd like to thank each member of the panel for uh, giving us uh, such detailed answers. There, there is still the opportunity, uh, if you want to feed into the inquiry that the committee has had to submit written evidence. Uh, I think the date is the 28th of April is the last date for evidence. Uh, there is some flexibility on that, but I would encourage you to do that. And so I'd like to thank you all for, your, for the evidence session this morning. And I'd now, as that concludes committee business, to formally close the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>